tuning in tonight to I-80 Sports. Today we are previewing the 2023 Major League Soccer season for Orlando City. going to be an interesting one some of the the biggest changes around major league soccer happened to orlando this offseason so i'm really looking forward to having a discussion joining us is austin david from the orlando soccer show returning guest uh was on last year for our season preview and we're really happy to have you back austin appreciate you having me of course so why don't you tell us a little bit about where we can find your work uh well uh i guess as you mentioned already the the podcast the Orlando Soccer Show we've been doing that since 2015 uh it has uh, seen a lot of up and downs from the uh, Orlando City side of things we also cover Orlando Pride OCB and basically all Orlando soccer that's why we're called the Orlando Soccer Show uh in terms of written content you can find me over at the Orlando Sentinel where we cover uh, all the Orlando City and Pride uh we've got a big uh spread coming out right before the season starts uh, as well as the uh, Orlando Soccer Journal, where you can find everything else that doesn't make it to the Orlando Sentinel uh, in there. So that's 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 pretty much me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time out today to talk to us. Now, I'm going to assume most people watching this video, um, we're going to have a lot of Orlando fans, so we're going to go in depth a little later. But some of the people are, you know, are maybe new to Major League Soccer. What does even the the casual Major League Soccer fan need to know about Orlando City? This is kind of a team in 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 flux a little bit um last year they won a trophy which was their first in mls which was big you know big deal but the regular season finished as it did the previous year where they barely made it into the playoffs and they were out in the first round and there really wasn't much of a chance of them moving forward in the playoffs this year they're trying to change that a little bit they've let some players go they've traded some players away some players have just straight out left the claim the the team in general and then they brought in a lot of young potential a lot of young talent within this team and that's kind of where they are right now uh a lot of people have said that like this is this is the one of the better off seasons that orlando city's had maybe the best off season that orlando city has had on paper uh it certainly seems that way uh from the early days you know a lot yeah, of the people on twitter and people you know on reddit you know the major league soccer fans were saying you know orlando won the offseason they had a lot of changes they made a lot of signings but let's be honest they had to <laughs> yes yeah, you're not wrong they uh i mean losing a guy like junior urso trading away a guy like juan um they didn't have any depth up front they lost benji michel they lost alexander pato they needed to make some moves. This this team was at times anemic offensively, and they needed, especially since they're going to be playing in basically four different competitions this year, they needed to bring in depth. They needed to bring in guys that could play some of these games, the, the Champions, uh, the Campeones Cup, the U.S. Open Cup, and the Champions League, as well as the regular season. All of these these t tournaments are going to be hitting them fast and furious all at the same sure. time. And so you need depth and you need to spend money. And the fact that they won a trophy last year means that, you know, there's higher expectations now, you know, sure. now th because they set that that bar pretty low at the beginning. They said this is this is the least we could do is win a trophy. And now that they've done that, what else is there for them to do? Now, Orlando City was 14, 6, and 14, 44 goals against, and a 53 goal differential. Um, oh, sorry, 56 goals against. Mm. And it was a negative nine goal differential. The same goal differential is Chicago Fire. So, we talk about some timely scoring. You guys lost by a lot in some games, and then you won some, some squeakers to even put you in the situation where you were, which is the final, the seventh and final playoff spot. Let's take a look at the goal scores. Who contributed? on the offensive side of the ball. Erkan Kara, kind of in his, uh, I guess, his coming out party last season, 11 goals, three assists. Facundo Torres, nine goals, eight assists. Junior Urso, five goals, four assists. Alexandra Pato, three goals, five assists. And Mauricio Pereira, one goal and eight assists. When we talk about the goal scores, what was the story of last season? Inconsistency. 
that that is the biggest story of this team. They were the most consistently inconsistent team that I have seen in terms of an Orlando City team. Where yeah, Urchan Kara scored eleven goals, but there were ga- there were games where he was completely invisible, and he was coming out in the sixtieth, seventieth minute because there was just nothing he could do in the game, and he's so dependent on guys feeding in the ball. He is a good clinical finisher, but he is not a creator for himself. He needs other guys to create for him. Sure. That's why you bring in a guy like Martin Ojeda uh, and even Gaston Gonzalez last year, who was supposed to be your your winger on the other side of Facundo Torres, but he tore his ACL the last game that he was playing in Argentina. So that plan was uh, delayed a little bit. But now that you have Ojeda, Gonzalez, and Facundo Torres, all U22 signings basically except for Facundo who's a designated player and Martin also designated player but all young guys under the age of 25 and they're basically your core of the offense now you have Urchan who's your finisher but you have so many guys who are not only creators but can also finish for themselves like you mentioned with Facundo nine goals eight assists I mean he was the breakout player of this Orlando City team last sure. year and he was, and you, you tipped know, us off you talked about it in the preview of last season and we kind of laughed hey who is this guy and yeah, he delivered. He mm-hmm. he played really good for this Orlando City team last year. Now, we talked a little bit about youth and about how the team is kind of transitioning from, you know, something that maybe wasn't working last year um, into trying to bring in better players. Um, like you said, raise the expectations. Orlando City was 25th out of 28 in home field advantage. They only had an 8% home field advantage if we're talking about po- uh, total points. Um, not good. Let's talk about some of the players who left first. Now, the one thing that struck me right away, you guys lost a lot of talent, but you lost, lost both fullbacks with Juan and uh, who was the other guy? Uh, Jao Moutinho. Yeah, Joao, yeah. Both on their way out, and you had to obviously replace those positions. Um, what were some of the other big losses that you had? Oh, Junior Urso. I mean, five goals and four assists. Like, it wasn't just his production numbers. Uh, it was the the dirty work that he did in the midfield he was a box-to-box midfielder he was getting back and helping defensively while also getting into the attack he was just so Im- imperative not just in terms of what he did but also the minutes that he played I mean in the time that he was in Orlando he was one of the highest minutes uh, played of any player sure. on the team and when you lose a guy that can go out there and give you 80 90 minutes every single game and you don't even have to worry about him that's a that's a tough loss for Oscar Pereja to be able to re- try and replace, and I, I think that he is is probably one of the biggest guys to be able to to try and find a replacement for. And you already have in the midfield a guy like Cesar Araujo, who was a breakout star in and of himself. Another guy from Uruguay who came in and really bossed the defensive midfield for Orlando City. There were questions of. Sebas Mendez, who ended up going to LAFC, you know, sure. he was a breakout star for them the year before, and he came out and supplanted him and made him basically obsolete within the team. And when you have a guy that that is able to do that, it's it's very impressive. But then when you look at what they were able to do otherwise when he wasn't playing, or sure. uh, you know, when you when you had guys that weren't in the starting eleven that weren't playing. Uh, and you had to play their backups. They just weren't cutting it. And when you go back to that that negative goal differential, it kind of plays into the fact that uh, Antonio Carlos was hurt for a long period of time. They had to go with Rodrigo Schlegel, their their backup center back, who did a good job in his own right. But uh, I mean, there were points where uh, I think there was a game last year, mid middle of summer, where they didn't have any of their center backs available. Yeah, and that that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, uh, I think. I think Schlegel was available, and he was playing with Kyle Smith, who is a right back. Um, it's not ideal. Yeah, and Schlegel's a guy you want in the penalty kicks, right? <laughs> not not not, uh, not necessarily being your best center back option. So you did have some roster turnover. You you got some new guys in. Uh, Martin Ojeda, five million dollars left winger. Let's talk about what he means to the team. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of him in preseason, just in the couple games that they've played. He's dynamic, and and that's kind of what you expect from him. He's He is a similar player to Facundo, where he is very good on the ball. He's technical. He can finish. He can assist. And having a guy that can play basically anywhere in the attack, just like Facundo, kind of plug and play in on the wing or in the center of the park, he's a- another player that defenses have to watch out for. And I think last year, when you had just Facundo playing or 
just Mauricio Pereira playing or, or just one of these guys playing defenses could hone in on those guys and say sure. all right we're going to mark yeah. them out of the game and Orlando can't do anything outside of that now you give defenses a problem where you say okay well if we mark this guy then this guy's going to be free and if we mark this guy this guy's going to be free basically everybody in the attacking third now for Orlando deserves their own attention And I think that is what Orlando was missing last year based on how many goals they were able to score versus concede. Because like I said, there were times where Orlando's offense was just completely gone for for days on end. Yeah. For, 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 for match days on end. Good. Um, when I look at his stats, Ojeda over the past five seasons, um, with racing club and Godoy Cruz in Argentina, um, not a ton of playing time, but he did get 27 starts in his last season. Um, 19 goals and 14 professional assists in about 60 pro games. So that's good, but you want to step forward, um, and he's going to have that opportunity with his club, right? Yeah, and, and the funny enough, Ojeda was actually being scouted by Orlando City before Facundo Torres. Like, this was this is okay. a long time, long time coming. Making. It is. And, and you know, uh, we talked with um, Luis Muzi, the uh, EVP and GM of Orlando City, and he said, like, before before we even brought Facundo in here, we were talking to Martin and we were like, we want him here. We want to build this team around you. And that's per- probably why he ended up coming to Orlando, because after his last breakout season, there were teams from Europe, teams from Brazil, kind of calling for him and saying, hey, we want to bring you here. But because Orlando was so adamant about him being the central piece of this new puzzle, uh, plus the fact that he talked with some of his uh, former teammates in Rodrigo Schlegel, uh, who played in Argentina as well, that kind of helped a little bit in bringing him to Orlando uh, and, and getting him as the focal point of this offense now. Now, you also brought in Ramiro Enrique, center forward. Um, we don't even have him, just spoiler alert for when you pull the depth chart up, we don't have him starting every day. Um, kind of a depth piece, and let, hey, let's see what we got with the guy. Ramiro Enrique, what's expected from him this season? That is a, a very good question. He's going to be the guy that, that probably comes in for Urchon Kara or starts on occasion for Urchon Kara, uh, depending on the situation. He still hasn't reported to training camp yet. He still doesn't have his visa sorted. So there's still a lot of question marks in terms of what he's actually going to be able to do. I, you know, it's, uh, I don't even know if he'll be here for the, the end of preseason at this rate, but he's going to be the, the guy that they rely upon to score goals when Urchon Kara is not in. And he's going to be somebody who can press the back line and, uh, in late game situations or bring energy you know he's a u22 player so he's got a lot of uh, youth behind him he's, he's also a u21 player i mean he's young yeah. he's 20 years old two professional uh seasons again in argentina that's kind of a thematic thing i think we're going to see with this orlando squad and uh you know maybe not starter caliber yet but you know hey if if you have room on these major league soccer teams to carry young guys Start your kids. Go go after it, and you know maybe he's going to turn into something. And if not, you spend a couple million dollars. It's not my money. Who cares, right? Yeah, and, and not only that, but they have a a very good depth in terms of the striker position now with Enrique and Cara. Yeah. Plus, it's not even mentioning the Mac Herman winner Duncan McGuire, who's third on the depth chart, maybe even fourth, because they also have Jack Lynn, who is one of the best goal scorers in. Uh, in MLS next pro last year with Orlando city B. So they have a lot of players that are starting to come about in terms of their goal proficiency. And it's at the right time too, because they're going to need a lot of these players to step up uh, with so many games to play this year. So let's get into that depth chart here. We already talked, uh, Urchan Kara, I guess that's the p- correct pronunciation. I guess mm-hmm. everyone else in Major League Soccer has been using Urkan, like <laughs> like a hard K sound. Um, Urchan Kara and Enrique at center forward. Now, we've talked about the wings, Facundo Torres on one side um, and Ojeda on the other. Um, and you got Gonzalez behind them. That's a nice little attracting tr- attacking trident there, huh? Yeah, and th- this isn't even like a- 100% official because uh, the way that they've been running things in preseason... Uh, granted, there are, there are players that are missing right now and they have to kind of adapt, but they've been running sure. like a three center back set with uh, Villar Cartagena as a third center back. Um, I don't know how much that will actually end up coming to pass, but it is still notable that they've been kind of having uh, a three five, or a three four three, a three five one kind of set sure. where the front three are interchangeable where they're having Ojeda's play centrally and then 
Um, they're having Petrasso as a wing back out wide, the new left back. Um, they've even put in Ivan Angulo, who was a midseason signing last year. They've been playing him as a right wing back. And he's just an energetic guy. It kind of, it's interesting. You know, Oscar Pereira is, told me yeah. that he wanted to switch things up. He said this team needed a refresh. And he didn't say specifically about the tactical side. But it might be time for a, a tactical refresh as well. Because the way things have been going so far for the last couple of years of Orlando City, they've been kind of... Things are expected of them, like predictable, predictable. Right. And, and and when I look at this, um, I'm pulling up their stats from last year. Thirty times out of thirty five games that they played, they lined up in a four two three. Mm -hmm. um, they only used the three man back line once. Um, so that's probably not the most likely way they're going to go. But we don't know. We're not we're not in the know. We're just making based on the players available um what could be you know the best starting 11 now when you talk about this uh five man whatever kind of uh mix them up you go into i can look at the midfield because that's probably where there's going to be the most change game from game so let's talk about the the midfielders we have three predicted here let's talk about the the role of the midfield and then who fills in that role the best yeah and, th and this is kind of the most interesting part of this this lineup right now is because cesar araujo is is the bona fide starter but in the other defensive midfield position, you could have Vilder Cartagena, who's also a defensive-minded midfielder. But then you could also have Mauricio Pereira drop deep, which we did see a number of times sure. last year. He was playing as as an eight, basically your box-to-box, -box, kind of your junior or so type. And then you could see Martin Ojeda move into the center while you say Gaston Gonzalez starts on the left. I, there's really a ton of options for Oscar to be able to kind of pull out. And then we haven't even mentioned the the new guy from Iceland, Dagger Dan Thurhalsen, who is who, basically... Who we're we're going to call Dagger Dan on this show because <laughs> that is the hardest Major League Soccer name I've, I've ever uh, heard. It's like, it's like D-A-G-R. You, you, uh, your enunciation is perfect. Any who watches <laughs> ID Sports for more than five minutes knows that uh, what we do on the show is mispronounce names, um, not meaning disrespect, but when we're covering 29 teams, it's kind of hard to get the perfect inflection. It's Dagger Dan. That's got to be the name. Yeah, yeah, it's um, he's 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 just one of those guys that he is a plug and play guy. Um, one of the Icelandic journalists who used to cover him said that he was the Swiss Army knife of Icelandic soccer, where he could play in the midfield, he could play in the attack, he can even play as a fullback. And having a guy that is a plug and play kind of guy who can play a multitude of positions, and so far in the games that he has played in preseason, has actually shown out pretty well. Great. Um, you could see him starting as well. And that's not even mentioning an MLS veteran, Felipe, who they brought in as as kind of one of those guys that could be... And I just want to say, I mean, between uh, Cesar Araujo and Mauricio Pereira, a guy named Dagger Dan and Felipe, you got some ankle breakers in midfield <laughs> with those guys. I mean, you're talking a yellow card every game. If they end up playing, yeah. That's... Uh, Felipe does have a reputation within the league, and uh, I, I know Orlando fans have seen it in action when he was playing with the Red Bulls or with Austin even, where you know he's been with, I think, six or seven MLS teams now at this point in his career. Uh, in fairness, those Red, Bull, those, those Red Bull tackles, those were all clean. Every 100% uh, yeah, clean. Of, of every course. single one. Okay. Yeah, especially that one... Uh, oh, there was, there was one. I think it was Sasha Kleschen, like, took out Kyle Aaron's ankles or something, and... Uh, anyways, uh, the Red Bulls have a very uh, interesting history with Orlando City, and that makes the first game of the season even more interesting. But uh, yeah, the midfield is going to be a very uh, intriguing piece for Oscar Pereja because there's so many different permutations that he could run out there. There's just no be there's no way of predicting it. You know, it, it, uh, there's only so much I can see in preseason, and what we see from then and what we see on the day of uh, could vary from from hours. And you, you think, just so we're on the same page, like, there's no best three. It's going to change, uh, like, systematically throughout the season? Is that, or, I mean, I guess I'm asking you to put your, you know, look in the crystal ball here. Yeah, I mean, I think Mauricio Pereira, he was the original building block piece. You know, when they brought him in in 2019, I remember the, the front office staff saying, this is the guy we want to build yeah. around. He is the guy in the middle that everything kind of goes through. And now that they bring in Martin Ojeda does he supplant Mauricio as that guy? Because Mauricio was kind of on his way out before uh, he re-signed at the end of this past season. Um, his production level has kind of dropped a bit. He's a great assist guy, 
you know, but he's older. He's, he can't do as much as he could do as before. So I, I, I'd i like to say Ojeda and Mauricio and Cesar Araujo are probably your front three or in the middle, shall sure. I say. Uh, but it all depends also on Gaston Gonzalez's health. You know, is he ready to start games? Or maybe does Ivan Angulo start out on the wide? Or maybe their new draft pick, who was one of the top five draft picks in Shaq Muhammad out of Duke. He's also a winger who can play on those positions. There's there's just so many different permutations. It's a good problem to have if you're Oscar, but there's just no way to be able to predict what is going to happen based on the just the names. Absolutely. Now, you guys went out this offseason, and we're going to change to the fullback position here. Mm. Lost both your fullbacks. Then you signed uh, Luca Petrazzo from Toronto, and I said, oh, that addressed the situation. He's not the best. Boom, Rafael Santos comes in. You guys get a second left back. Um, two guys who would obviously start on most major league soccer teams. Let's talk about uh, the fullbacks, what's expected of them, and then the players themselves. Yeah, so in terms of Rafael Santos and Petrasso, uh, well, Santos, I think, has just gotten into Orlando as of, like, today or yesterday. So he hasn't really actually gotten, like, full training with the team just yet. Um, Petrasso has been. I would probably say Petrasso starts early on, basically just because he's had the couple weeks of preseason that Santos hasn't. Sure. But you bring in a guy like Rafael Santos to eventually become the starter, and Heck, the fact that they have two left backs is something that they didn't have last year. They had Jao Moutinho and Kyle Smith, and that was their left back depth. And Kyle Smith is a right footed right back. So having actual two actual left backs is is a good thing comparatively to last year. Uh, Petrasso has MLS experience. Rafael Santos doesn't. And, you know, Petrasso did well in Toronto. Uh, he didn't like he wasn't a standout player necessarily. He wasn't like you know, setting the world on fire, but he's a solid MLS player and he's young as well. So uh, I like the signings. Uh, depends on, you know, how things kind of play out for them on that side. And then the other side, they got rid of Juan, who was arguably one of the fastest players in MLS and he went to DC United. The biggest issue with him is that, yeah, he's fast, but he can't cross. Um, and that how, was how I, I just want to stop you there for a second because I hear a lot of mixed reviews from people in Orlando on what they think about Juan during his time <laughs> there. Um, I appreciate that he brought someone to your FIFA squad that could burn <laughs> everyone else down the sideline. Um, but it seems like he's a kind of a polarizing player now that he's gone. You could say whatever you want. What do you think about him? Yeah, I mean, I, I even when he was here, I was I was saying this, you know, he he had no ability to cross the ball. And he had moments where he would put a great cross into the box, but nine times out of 10, that ball was going anywhere than it where, where it was supposed to be. And I mean, I remember there was a time where he crossed the ball so badly that it end. I think it ended up like in the second row of goal, like behind the goal. And again, there was like one game where he had a stat of like, out of the 12 crosses he had, 11 of them were off target. And you just can't have that, that that's a problem. On, on the right side. And so they haven't brought anybody in to replace him. And this has been the kind of most interesting position, I would say, in terms of like who would start. Because Kyle Smith has a, the MLS veteranship. Sure. He's been with the team for a couple of years now, came in in uh, 2018 and has been here since, kind of been the, the plug-and-play guy in the defensive end of things. But Mikey Holiday has been starting for the uh, US U-20 national team. He's been getting call-ups. He's played in the U-20 World Cup. And he is almost as fast, if not, I've been told, faster than Huan. And he's also got better crossing ability. Now, again, he's young. He just hasn't had the opportunity to play necessarily. And trading Huan and not bringing anyone in may be the sign that it's Mikey Holiday's time sure. to start at that right back position. Or it could be poor planning. I mean, it could be one or the <laughs> other. Um, let's move on and talk a little about this uh, center back situation. Antonio Carlos back from injury. Rodrigo Schlegel is uh, back, you know, kind of a MLS name, but not necessarily for strength in defense. And then you have the kid Williams. Isn't that kid like uh, another 18-year-old? Yeah, yeah, you're missing um, 
you're missing one player uh, on the, the center back depth chart. Uh, that's Robin Janssen, who's going to be the other starter. Schlegel's going to be behind both of them. Um, but in terms of uh, Thomas Williams, he's another kid who's been getting U.S. Women, uh, youth national team call-ups. And he's kind of an interesting prospect because in his youth, he's been playing as a left back, but he's like 6'2", 6'3". And so you would assume he could play as a, a center back, which he has been in, in some MLS games, but there were also some games where he was playing out as a left back and they haven't really quite figured out his, his best position just yet. And it's, it's been interesting to see that, you know, he's still kind of listed as a center back, not necessarily a fullback. And, I don't know how much game time he's going to get with the first team. I think he'll still probably spend a lot of time with OCB and just trying to get some experience under him. That's the biggest thing for him. Uh, but as of right now, it's it's Carlos and then Robin Janssen as the other center back, Rodrigo Schlegel as the third center back. And then they brought in this other kid, uh, Abdi Salim from Syracuse, sure. who was a late draft pick. He's the only one that officially hasn't signed, but... I've seen him play. He was starting a, uh, the two preseason games. He looks solid. I mean, he's big. He doesn't get bodied off the ball very easily. He's got good positional awareness. He's got good heading ability. He's got a very powerful right foot. I, I don't. I, I expect them to probably sign him to maybe an OCB deal or maybe sign him and loan him down. But I mean, he can do a job in MLS. Uh, he was he was defending very well against Minnesota's front three when they were playing in their preseason game. And I think there could be something there with him, but uh, time will tell. Absolutely. So let's move on now um, to kind of coaching and tactics. If you're watching Orlando for the first time, what are the kind of things you're going to see? Boy, um, in, in the history of Oscar Pereja's team, it has really been a lot of methodical buildup and, that that's kind of helped and hurt a lot. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, and like you mentioned earlier, this team has become a bit predictable in terms of what they want to do. Every team knows what they want to do. It's just a matter of being able to stop the team from being able to do what they want to yeah, do. Fair. And you you have very dynamic playmakers on the wings. You have a guy that has great field of vision in the middle, in Mauricio Pereira. And they like to play through the middle. Historically speaking, they will give the ball to Mauricio. He'll get it out wide. Um, Urchankara can be kind of a hold-up nine where he'll get the ball up top, let the wingers kind of run overlap him, and then he'll make a run forward to try and get on top of it. Um, There are other times where this team has become kind of route one and direct. When they had Benji Michel up top, they basically just kind of bomb it down forward, let him run run it down, and then kind of hold it up, let everyone else get back forward. Um but like I said, this team has had to adapt so many different times because whatever was working up front wasn't working. So they've had to change up things a little bit, sure. but um, they love utilizing their midfielders. They love having inverted wingers where they have guys that will cut in versus just crossing. And then they'll have overlapping fullbacks where guys will get over top. You know, if you have Facundo Torres on the right hand side, he'll cut in on his left. The fullback will overlap. He'll pass it over top and then the cross will come in. Uh, you see that a lot with Orlando City uh, over the last couple of years. So um, that's kind of the way Orlando City likes to play in terms of using their personnel. What are some of the biggest storylines we have for Orlando this season? I think in terms of, of where this team is headed, you know, they're coming off that U.S. Open Cup victory. They're going to be playing in Champions League for the first time. They're going to be playing uh, Campeones Cup. They're going to be playing uh, U.S. Open Cup to now try and defend their title. Um, I think just, just kind of where they go from here, because the biggest thing over the last three years for Orlando City has been first, making the playoffs. And they, they did that. That was the, the mission from 2015 sure. to 2020. Then it was, well, let's win a trophy. Now that they've done that, what's next for them? You know, is it, winning is it winning two trophies? But is that yeah. realistic? I, I think on pa- it's it's really hard to say because on paper this team looks deep. It looks great. But I, I'm hesitant to say this team's going to be great because there have been teams in the past where they look great on paper. They look like they're going to be world sure. beaters. They're going to be one of the best teams in the league. 
But MLS is such a unique beast where players, especially young players, sometimes have hard times adjusting yeah. to the yep. flying, to the the just the the heat, the weather, the, the living away from home for the first time ever. These factors kind of have to come into play, especially for kids that are 19, 20, 21, 22 years old who have never left home, who have never gotten outside of their comfort zone. Sure. It's a complete culture shock coming into the U.S., especially coming from uh, you know South American countries or even Europe sometimes. It really depends on on how they gel and how they adapt into the team, into the culture, into the, the setting that has uh, become their new home. And sometimes it works. Sometimes... It's an sure. easy transition, and sometimes they just it doesn't, and it may take a year, it may take more, and sometimes it just doesn't at all. So I'm hesitant to say this team is going to be you know one of the top teams in MLS because we just don't know how that will will affect them. Sure. Um, but from what I've seen, this team will be good. This team will probably make the playoffs at the very least. Um, but that's the least they could do. I think that that's I definitely that's, think. They got better since last season, but you know there are so many factors. There are a lot, there are a lot of ifs, ands, or buts. We do have to move on because we're finishing up the episode. Let's move on to some quick hit questions. What's the mm -hmm. biggest strength of this team? Goalkeeper, Pedro Galese. Definitely, 100%. The, the one position we have not talked about, what, El Pulpo? Yes. Is that what they call him? The, uh, the, the octopus. octopus. Yeah, he's, I mean, there was a big question of if he was going to come back this offseason. Sure. A lot of questions about money. Uh, they gave him what he wanted. And he is now back, but he is the best goalkeeper that Orlando City has ever had. And that that, that is backed up by statistics. So uh, getting him back and getting him kind of locking down the defense, helps everything. Yep. It, it helps everything going forward because not only does he stop goals from going in, but he's also a good leader on the field in terms of directing traffic in the defense, uh, starting counterattacks from the back. You know, he, he's yep. kind of a do-it-all kind of guy. So I think... It just in terms of the importance of him on the field, because everything goes from back to forward. So I think that's that's kind of where I would say the, the most important piece is. Uh, biggest weakness? I would say right back right now, be, just because we don't know how Mikey Holiday is going to, to react if he is the starter. Uh, Kyle Smith can do a job, but he is not an everyday starter. Sure. Um, so th that's just because it's the biggest question mark right now for this team. It's going to be right back. One player outside of our projected opening day 11 that we need to know. Who has the best chance of getting a job and making an impact this season? Ooh. Um, I would say Gaston Gonzalez. You know, he was brought in in the U22 initiative sure. deal last year, tore his ACL, didn't get on the field. Uh, he's healed miraculously well, and he seemingly, according to Oscar, has is ready to go now. But there's still a lot of, of questions about him and how he'll adapt, but from what I've seen from him, from what people have told me about him, he's the real deal, and he can be a very, very integral priest to this team uh, as the season goes on. What player is most likely to drop outside the starting 11? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. I think the battle at left back is going to be the most interesting with Santos and Petrasso, simply because, you know, Santos hasn't gotten here. Petrasso, if he does well enough, can earn the job, and Oscar likes to go with the hot hand. He doesn't like to shift things up too much based on who he has available. Sure. If a guy is playing well, he'll keep him in. So if Petrasso, who's probably going to start opening day, locks down that position, um, it might be Rafael Santos's to try and win now and rather than you know his to lose, uh, which I think a lot of people expected kind of heading into the season. Absolutely. And last but not least, who is your biggest rival? Ha! Huh. A lot of people used to say Atlanta. I would say probably it's become Miami now, who have also retooled themselves and brought a former oh, yeah. Atlanta player and Joseph Martinez into their team. But uh, it's the Florida Derby. You know, the the name of that Derby has not quite been a hundred percent confirmed. A lot of people are saying a multitude of different things, but uh, the rivalry with Miami is definitely the the, the rivalry at this point now. All right, Austin. Thank you again for coming on and joining us. Uh, always love to hear 
what you have to say. We have some comments coming in a little bit late now, uh, but you know, thank you guys for for tuning in and watching. We have a game coming up uh, really soon, February twenty sixth. Orlando kicks off against New York Red Bulls, and uh, you know, being a Red Bulls homer myself, I do have to say it's going to be a very interesting game. Red Bulls, mm. especially last year, they they have been closing down so much faster in the press, um, getting you know just tapping the toe, kicking the ankle, just just getting there. Not hard fouls, but they're fouling a lot these days. What is the over under you have on yellow cards for that match? Oh wow, um, ah, five and a half. Five and a half. I love it. And you're taking the over under. I'm gonna take the over. Uh, it's it's still gonna be kind of preseason for teams. Uh, sure. I think they're gonna be very clumsy in some of the challenges, and I think it's gonna depending on who the ref is. First off, because some some refs like to let them play, yeah. and some some yeah. of them will they're not afraid to show a card or two. With, so. with the with the quick pressing, that's you know kind of uh, the the struggle now that that I think Red Bulls are kind of facing, where they're closing down so fast and they're running so fast that mm-hmm. just a little tap sends a guy you know flying. It's not really a violent challenge. I mean, it's, it's definitely not a violent team, but you can watch you know when they played like Cincy last year or a couple of games versus NYCFC and there were just bodies on the ground. It's going to be mm. very interesting to see. So ha- good luck, have a great season. Uh, not too much luck in that opener, <laughs> uh, but thank you. Again. And Austin for joining us. Uh, love having you on. Very, very insightful. Thanks for taking time out of your uh, busy Thursday night here. And I hope to hear from you real soon. Yeah, appreciate you having me. All right. And everyone at home, thank you for watching ID Sports. Remember, you can go to idsports.com, read weekly sports book articles. One of the only places you can read weekly Major League Soccer sports book articles. Um, you can find all 29 teams previewed on our YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great week.